The Lord be with you. Thank you and good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, the 17th Sunday after the day of Pentecost. For those of you worshiping here in the sanctuary and those of you joining us via Facebook Live or watching a video of this service uh, later on uh, Sunday afternoon, we welcome you. We welcome you here in Christ's name. And as we are preparing for, for worship today, I actually got ahead of the chimes, I I'm sorry. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> anyway, there are two inserts for um, youth fundraisers and ministry. One is a community uh, ministry, Kinsley's, uh, Kinsley's fourth birthday celebration, something our youth participated in last year. And then a fundraiser, Dutch Mills Bulb, Dutch Mills Bulbs fundraiser. I won't try to say that very fast, but the order form is on the back. And also, following worship today, there is information found on your uh, calendar page on the back regarding the uh, annual or semi-annual Spud lunch that our youth. Uh, that our youth provide and is a fundraiser specifically for the youth group, for the youth group as well. And the calendar that uh, for the rest of the week, a Bible study for Wednesdays uh, began. Did it begin this past Wednesday or is it starting this Wednesday? It started last Wednesday. Good. Yeah, I needed so. If you were not aware that it had started uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evenings in Westminster Hall on the Book of Romans, and next Sunday, a week from today, in both services, we'll, we will receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for World Communion Sunday. So now, as our prelude is being played, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Hi, sorry, I You're told fine. you yes, and then I forgot. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we start, before I start, I um, just wanted to give a quick update on a couple of things uh, related to the technology that you see. Uh, being used every Sunday. We put um, a kind of write-up in the steeple about the, the Mevo camera and the upgrades we made to the sound system and things like that. Um, we are now reaching um, hundreds of people each week uh, with our online videos and our live worship services, which has just been really, really great. Uh, people who have moved away uh, have been reconnecting with the church or people who grew up here and now, you know, of course, live somewhere else. Um, it's been really great hearing from them. And then also people who are at home and maybe not quite comfortable coming back to worship yet, or if you're feeling ill or things like that, there are people worshiping at home with us. So it's been a really, really great thing that we've done here at the church. Um, however, we are now getting into a point, um, now that we're getting back to kind of a normalized schedule, uh, Nikki and myself, of course, I have to be up here playing, and uh, like this Sunday, uh, Nikki's back preparing for the Spud Luncheon, and so that leaves uh, no one back there to man the actual camera side of things. So folks who are at home um, are just kind of watching. There will be no text or lyrics or things like that on the screen for this week because we don't have someone to do that. So what we are asking is if there's anyone out there who would every so often just be willing to help us uh, with that, we would really appreciate it. If you can use a smartphone or you can use your iPad, you can run the camera, okay? It's just as easy as clicking a couple of buttons, and we'd certainly be happy to uh, train you and make sure you're comfortable with it. We wouldn't throw you into anything like that. Uh, but if you are interested in helping with that in any way, we would appreciate it. And then, like I said, it would just be whenever uh, Nikki or myself are not able to do it. 
Um, so not very often, but every so often things like this pop up. So for the folks at home that are watching, uh, we apologize that the lyrics for, and the call to worship and things like that won't be popping up today. Um, but that just means some of you got to help us out. So if you're interested, uh, please let us know. And now we will prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join in the call to worship and the prayer of confession. Give ear, O people, to the Lord's teachings. Incline your ears to the words of his mouth. And he will tell to the present and coming generations the glorious deeds and wonders that God has done. Let us breathe deeply of the Lord's goodness as we come into God's courts with praise. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, have mercy upon us as we confess our sins. How often we do not do what we intended or promised, and how frequently we do what we said we would not. We hear your word preached, and we give our act. But faith is found wanting when it comes time to follow and obey. When confronted by conflict and circumstances requiring decisive attitudes and actions, we find our desires to be at odds with what you command, not doing what you expect of your disciples. Have mercy upon us, O God, and in Christ forgive us, and then enable us with your strength to do your will. Amen. Let us continue in a moment of silent personal confession. <clears throat> 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses is made unto salvation. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. At this time, the children should come forward with Pastor Jimmy. This morning you good how's school you staying well trying to hope so remember when we used to have chapel in preschool kind of sort of you want to help me with a quick song this morning one we've done before one that we started chapel just this past week in preschool. And uh, it's the first uh, song we teach preschool students every year. And because sports more or less, kind of, sort of, have started back, it's the one that's our, our cheer that we're happy to, to praise God with. Can um, you stand right over here with me? Yeah, right, yeah, right over there. And face this way. Okay, you ready? You remember? I'll sing it. You can just help me do the hand signals, okay? Are you ready? Remember, point to yourself. I will magnify the Lord who is greatly to be praised. I will magnify the Lord who is greatly to be praised. And remember, Hosanna. Oh, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Oh, good. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Yes, you've got a good memory. Let's thank our leader here. Okay. Now you're going to follow. Oh, no, no, no. You can't say that. Yeah. I know we're Presbyterian, and I know we're not maybe putting hands over our head, but we'll be okay. All right? So you're going to help us out here? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. I will magnify the Lord who is greatly to be praised. I will magnify the Lord who is greatly to be praised. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock. As always, I want to thank you for your prayers and your ongoing support of this part of Christ Church with your tithes, your offerings, and again, also your prayers and other gifts of which God has blessed each of us and for the enabling the life and ministry of this church to be able to continue during this uh, time of the pandemic. Wish we could know when 
or wish there could be a time, boom, it's over. But pandemics, illnesses have their own schedule. And so, nevertheless, I am especially thankful, though, to all of you and pray that our gifts and our offerings indeed will be a delight to God and will be blessed for Christ's purpose and proclamation of his gospel. As you are able, let us stand as the doxology is being played. gifts, O God, may we indeed be truly thankful that as we give of ourselves with time and talent and treasure, that these would be symbols indeed of our time and will and intention to be your disciples and your servants. We pray in Jesus' name and may all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our prayers today, we are, we are thankful for the flowers uh, given to the glory of God in memory of Scott Crago, with love from Chris and Pat. And... We announced last week concerning Mason's brother, Caleb, a recent uh, cancer diagnosis, and there is an address in the uh, bulletin insert for any that might like to send uh, notes of love and encouragement or cards. And we need to add to our list of concerns and intercessions this morning. We are... Uh, thankful that uh, Shar and Bill are, are back with us, that Shar's mom, Esther Mang, her surgery um, went, went well? It went well. It was more extensive than they thought. That's what, more extensive than thought, but it went, it went well. And uh, so thanks be to God, and as we continue to pray for as well, Allison and Colin Seaman. Barb is getting close, if I understood her correctly, um, to this phase or particular kind of, um, of chemo, and Bill is uh, about halfway through his, my memory is correct, and so as we continue our prayers for Barb and Bill and Allison and Colin, Vicki Lewis and Kim Catherman as well as Caleb and their various cancer diagnoses, we also want to remember Edie Macrath, Jean Reisinger, Robert Merritt Jr. recovering uh, still from a four-wheeler accident, um, a new intercession this week. Uh, Owen Forsey was, if I pronounce his last name correct, uh, was added uh, to, um, to our prayer list. And what to um, add, we have two members of the confirmation class that have started meeting again and will be joining the church. Um, uh, if we were thinking maybe October 25th, but if... Uh, for them to meet with the session and then join the church, maybe you're probably looking at November the 1st, but I want your prayers for Neela and for, uh, for Haley. 
and um, their, their learning and their interest uh, today um, in the confirmation class and add prayers for them. As well as uh, the Gulf Coast from just uh, west of Rockport, Texas, all the way over to Pensacola, Florida. Various tropical storms and Hurricane Sally and the fires that um, are still, still raging in the west and for all, that means all of us, um, as we pray for God's strength and help and love in caring for one another and ourselves with the, uh, with the pandemic. And folks in our community and in our nation and our world, that, and for those who have lost loved ones uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 virus, we lift them up this day as well. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for receiving, as we have named, folks individually or by region or location or circumstance in our nation, in our world, and that you are responding even now to each person's particular circumstance and need for those continuing to receive medication for cancer and other illnesses, that you enfold them with your strength and your presence and your merciful care, that you keep those safe who are recovering from those who are recovering from the, um, or trying to recover from recent tropical storms along our Gulf Coast and the fires in the West, that for those among us who need your help or strength, bearing burdens only known to them and to you, that you hold them up as you promise in your word with your righteous right hand, and that you enable us as a church and a church family to care for one another and keep us and help us and enable us to be your disciples and witnesses for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray as we with our fellow sisters and brothers throughout the world on this Lord's Day, as we pray with them the words of the prayer, Lord Jesus, that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first scripture lesson for this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. Listen now to God's word for us this day. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land. While it returned unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, 
he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our scripture readings continue again from the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. Again, I invite us all to hear the Word of God. This is after Jesus had entered Jerusalem for the last time on Palm Sunday. And after the turning over of the money changers and the tables in the temple, in the temple courtyard, he returns the next day. And that's where verse 23 picks up. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And they said, By what authority? Are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven? Or was it of human origin? They argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then do you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then he continues with this parable. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they all said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you witnessed it, you did not change your minds and believe him as well. And the reading ended with the 32nd verse of the 21st chapter, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So may we all take God's word this day and use it for ourselves and as Christ's gift to the church and in this time of reading and proclamation. May the Holy Spirit give us all an open mind, a willing heart, 
and a ready spirit to respond. Let us pray. This scripture reading again in its wider biblical context is an answer to people in the immediate preceding scene of those who were questioning Jesus' authority. Remember again that Jesus had entered Jerusalem for the last time on Palm Sunday prior to his crucifixion, which would be on Friday of that same week. But he comes to the temple and turns over the tables of the money changers and the business people, selling items for sacrifice and people exchanging the coins or the currency of the Roman Empire for the currency to be used in the temple. Now it should be pointed out that under the rules of the temple, these merchants felt they had a perfect right to be there doing what they were, were doing and had the permission of the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers and the like. They were regulated so they did not overcharge or take advantage, yet it was too tempting for that, for some. And so we read of Jesus driving them out after entering Jerusalem in a paraphrase of the prophets, Isaiah and Zechariah, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when Jesus returns the next day, the chief priests and the leaders in charge of the temple operations want to know by what authority he does things like this. And by way of an answer, following a question about John the Baptist, Jesus tells them three parables of which the parable of the father who owned the vineyard and the two sons is the first. But first, Jesus says, what about John the Baptist? Let me ask you this question. Did, he, did what he did, his baptism, as a call to righteousness and a call to repentance, did it come from God or from human origin? Well, they kind of gather and huddle up and say, what are we to do? If we say from God, Jesus will say, well, then why don't you believe me? But if we say from man, from human origin, the people may riot because they believe John was a prophet, which is true. John the Baptist was the first sound of the voice of Israelite prophecy in probably perhaps 350 to 450 years. And Jesus points out to them that you think you are the ones favored by God, and yet you are not, you are not convinced yourselves about John's ministry, even though people like tax collectors and prostitutes were, and they came to be baptized and to repent. 
And that's when Jesus in this, tells this parable. And just as in the parable of the prodigal son, some difficult teachings are tied up in this story. We have a father of some means who owns a vineyard. He goes to both sons at different times and says, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. One says rather insolently, it seems, No, I will not. But then ends up going anyway. The other says something like, Right away, right away, sir. But doesn't go. And Jesus then asks the deceptively simple question, which of the two actually did the will of the Father? And there's more to the answer, this answer, than we might think. But nevertheless, I invite you to take a closer look with me Which is the more admirable of the two when all is said and done? The more the son who is more insolent and tends to be more disobedient? Or the one who with a bright and cheerful face says, I will, but does not? But the one who protests has some kind of change of heart? Well, the teachers were actually correct in answering Jesus' question at face value. And there are, there are three observations from this that I'd like to make about this parable. And the first is the meaning of the parable the warning to the religious leaders in Jesus' day and those that thought their outward shows of piety or displays of piety were enough to show the people. And therefore, they looked to be to the people as the favored ones of God. And they were therefore entitled to that favor continuously by their personal piety. Jesus confronts them elsewhere with about their fasting makeup, which made them look paler than usual on days when they were fasting. And Jesus pointed out that you are like whitewashed tombs, all white, nice and shiny on the outside, but within, filled with deceit and rot and the like. And Jesus is saying, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are those who said they would go their own way and then actually took God's way. And even though their appearance and their attitudes can be, you might want to judge them on those things, you are resting on personal piety with no foundation underneath. And the many times the people that you think are so far outside the kingdom of God they have no chance are actually the ones who are closer and not far from the kingdom of God, closer than you. Your shows of piety are frequently not enough. We get a warning of that in a very direct and kind of in-your-face way in the book of Acts. That incident in the early days of the church happened when a man named Barnabas, actually his given name was Joseph, and he, was, he sold some land and brought all of the proceeds and laid it at the disciples' feet. And he would later receive the nickname Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And he would travel with Paul on Paul's first missionary journey. But there was a couple 
who had promised obviously to also sell land and lay the proceeds at the feet of the apostles, but they kept a portion, but represented what they were giving as the whole proceeds. Well, we see what happens. And we are warned that a false display of piety can be a dangerous thing. And so, thinking that somehow our piety gets us out of service or getting our hands dirty for Christ, we need to be careful. In the words of one writer on this commentary in Matthew, he says, we say that we are going to work in the vineyard, but instead of harvesting the grapes, we spend our time rearranging the stones along the path. And yet, what about the attitude of the son? who first says no and then changes his mind and goes and works. That's not a very effective witness if we do that constantly. And this parable reminded me of a time in elementary school in the fourth grade. And two classmates of mine were sent outside the school to a creek to get water in a coffee can so that we could look and search for microscopic life with our microscopes and everything and what we were studying at the time. And they get the water, but they also decide to catch a bullfrog and tadpole eggs and bring them back into the class. Well. We're all kind of going silly and nuts when our teacher, Miss Fincher, walks back in, and she is not happy at all. And during this particular nine-week period, there was a chart for citizenship. And if you did something that was not appropriate, you had to put a check by your name, and every couple of checks, your citizenship grade would go down by half a letter grade or a letter grade or such. And she tells one of my classmates who had brought this frog, you need to go check your name. But I didn't do anything. And I'm sitting there glad because um, I had had to check my name previously that week or the week before for copying. <laughs> I wasn't good at fractions. I hope since then I've been forgiven. But nevertheless... She says, but don't you think by the rules we made as a class that you need to check your name, Alan? And he says, no, but I will. And how frequently have we felt that way when it comes to living out and practicing our faith? Busy calendars. We're too tired we're told we have to forgive and we don't want to. And all the many various things that pull for our time or we get from time to time disillusioned in faith or with the church. There's even a book written by one of my favorite authors, Philip Yancey. It was entitled Disappointment with God. And so, a lot of times, it's real easy when God asks us to do something, to be a witness, to be more compassionate or understanding, to be forgiving, to serve, to give. It's real easy to respond, no, but I will. Of which this son who goes to the vineyard anyway is a good example. 
And I find relief in this because it happens to me as a Christian and as a pastor. But we're in good company. Read some of the frustrations of those who wrote the Psalms. King David and others. Read the frustrations of Habakkuk and maybe even a better example, the prophet Jeremiah, who doesn't want to uh, even give thanks for the day he was born. And yet he's called as, a, as practically an adolescent, between adolescence and a teenager, and yet his answer always seemed to be, no, but I will. Even our Lord Jesus Christ in the garden, the night of his betrayal, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so, we're going to have days like this. But I think you would also agree that this is not a permanent attitude that we, that we want to have either. And the final observation is that we have two sons who each represent important, an important aspect, like two wings on an airplane, two important aspects of the Christian life. Prayer and study of scriptures and the practice, the practice of personal piety and, and listening for the Holy Spirit and listening for God and being in the presence of God and then being led how that leads us to serve. And to be a witness for the troublesome to the troublesome co-worker or the person that you've tried to forgive and they think they don't even need to be forgiven, much less did anything wrong. Or just simply, I remember I hadn't been in this area too long and I got a call on Friday that I was needed for something downtown here in Clearfield and I had all of these other plans and the like and it was one of those I don't think I said these words but I thought them okay no but I will and by the time the day was over I was glad I was there until the sky opened up and the rain poured as we were packing up everything to go home and I had that attitude all over again. But God can use us in any circumstances regardless of our mood or the like. But God also wants our witness to arise from our piety and our personal relationship to be one of profession and practice. And as the psalmist also says, to serve the Lord with gladness. Only Christ through the Holy Spirit, I think, can give us both, both of those aspects of serving Christ doesn't mean that some days we're not going to owe another committee meeting, another activity or the like. And it doesn't mean on other days that we may have trouble praying or finding the words or the like. But we have the promise we have the promise that the Spirit will intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. And we also have the promise that God does not 
call the qualified, but qualifies the called. That God will give us the means and ability to serve Him. Piety and display of our faith through service and sacrificial love, profession and practice. As one writer says in his commentary on the book of James later on in the New Testament, I've said it from this pulpit before and probably in other pulpits, but it bears repeating today that basically the question is, with the two sons, the couple who had a false show of generosity, and for all of us as we seek to live the Christian life in word and in service, for us all, when the day comes that we're ever accused of being Christians and Christ's disciples, will there be enough evidence to convict us? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We have heard God's word read and proclaimed and in response, I invite us, as we are able, to stand and affirm our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. May we stand. What do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
our time of prayer and intercessions that forgot to point out the note from Steve and Tracy Gross that is at the bottom of our worship order. And Steve is um, home from the hospital. I say home. He's back, uh, back in, uh, in rehab and continues to work hard just about every day in, reco in trying to recover. So <clears throat> anyway, just wanted, wanted you to not miss that as well. We gather here and worship each Lord's Day to remember that Jesus Christ is Lord, to be reminded of what it means to be God's people in Christ as well. As you go from this place, and as worship concludes in your homes or wherever you may find yourselves, having joined us here for worship this day, let us all go and live in the coming week knowing that we are loved and forgiven, known by name to God. In response, let us live as free and responsible people in Christ, serving Him and letting our service be our thank you for all that He has done. So may the Lord bless and keep you and make His face to shine upon you and give you that peace of Christ which passes all understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, with all of God's people saying, Amen.